Chapter 17, A Good Fellow Makes a Stand. Having watched the Beamishes out of sight, Spittleworth hurried off to the guard's room, where he found Roach keeping watch over the rest of the royal guard. The walls of the room were hung with swords and a portrait of King Fred, whose eyes seemed to watch everything that was happening. They're growing restless, my lord, muttered Roach. They want to go to their home to their families and get to bed. And so they shall. Once we've had a little chat, said Spittleworth, moving to face the weary and travel-stained soldiers. Has anyone got any questions about what happened back in the marshlands? He asked the men. The soldiers looked at each other. Some of them stole furtive glances at Roach, who retreated against the wall and was polishing a rifle. Then Captain Goodfellow raised his hand along with two other soldiers. Why was Beamish's body wrapped up before any of us could look at it? asked Captain Goodfellow. I want to know where that bullet went that we heard fired, said the second soldier. How come only four people saw this monster? If it's so huge, asked the third, to general nods and muttered agreement. All excellent questions, replied Spittleworth smoothly. Let me explain. And he repeated the story of the attack that he told Mrs Beamish. The soldiers who'd asked questions remained unsatisfied. I still reckon it's funny that a huge monster was out there and none of us saw it, said the third. If Beamish was half eaten, why wasn't there more blood? asked the second. And who, in the name of all that's holy, said Captain Goodfellow, is Nobby Buttons. How do you know about Nobby Buttons, blurted Spittleworth without thinking. On my way here from the stables, I bumped into one of the maids, Hetty, said Goodfellow. She served you your wine, my lord. According to her, you've just been telling poor Beamish's wife about a member of the Royal Guard called Nobby Buttons. According to you, Nobby Buttons was sent a message to Beamish's wife telling her he'd been killed. But I don't remember a Nobby Buttons. I've never met anyone called Nobby Buttons. So I ask you, my lord, how can that be? How can a man ride with us and camp with us and take orders from your lordship right in front of us without any of us ever clapping eyes on him? Spittleworth's first thought was that he'd have to do something about that eavesdropping maid. Luckily, Goodfellow had given him her name. Then he said in a dangerous voice, What gives you the right to speak for everybody, Captain Goodfellow? Perhaps some of these men have better memories than you do. Perhaps they remember poor Nobby Buttons clearly. Dear little Nobby, in whose memory the king will add a fat bag of gold to everybody's pay this week. Proud, brave Nobby, whose sacrifice, for I fear the monster has eaten him as well as Beamish, will mean a pay rise for all his comrades in arms. Noble Nobby Buttons, whose closest friends are surely marked for speedy promotion. Another silence followed Spittleworth's words, and this silence had a cold, heavy quality. Now the whole guard understood the choice facing them. They weighed in their minds the huge influence Spittleworth was known to have over the king and the fact that Major Roach was now caressing the barrel of his rifle in a menacing manner. And they remembered the sudden death of their former leader, Major Beamish. They also considered the promise of more gold and speedy promotion if they agreed to believe in the Ichabog and in private knobby buttons. Goodfellow stood up suddenly, that it, so suddenly that his chair clattered to the floor. There never was a Nobby Buttons, and I'm damned if there was an Ichabog, and I won't be party to a lie. The other two men who'd asked questions stood up as well, but the rest of the Royal Guard remained seated, silent and watchful. Very well, said Spittleworth. You three are under arrest for the filthy crime of treason. As I'm sure your comrades remember, you ran away when the Ichabog appeared. You forgot your duty to protect the king and thought only of saving your own cowardly hides. The penalty is death by firing squad. He chose eight soldiers to take three men away. And even though the three honest soldiers struggled very hard, they were outnumbered and overwhelmed. And in no time at all, they'd been dragged out of the guard's room. Very good, said Spittleworth to the few remaining soldiers. Very good indeed. There will be pay rises all round and I shall remember your names when it comes to promotions. Now, 
Don't forget to tell your families exactly what happened in the marshlands. It might bode ill for your wives, your parents and your children if they're heard to question the existence of the Ichabog or of Nobby Buttons. You may now return home. Chapter 18. End of an Advisor No sooner had the guardsmen got to their feet to return home than Lord Flapoon came bursting into the room looking worried. What now? groaned Spittleworth. Spittleworth, who was very much wanted his bath in bed. The chief advisor, panted Flapoon. And sure enough, Herringbone, the chief advisor, now appeared wearing his dressing gown and an expression of outrage. I demand an explanation, my lord, he cried. What stories are these that reach my ears? The Ichabog, real, Major Beamish, dead, and I've just passed three of the king's soldiers being dragged away under sentence of death. I have, of course, instructed that they be taken to the dungeons to await a trial instead. I can explain everything, Chief Advisor, said Spittleworth with a bow, and for the third time that evening, he related the tale of the Ichabog attacking the king and killing Beamish, and then the mysterious disappearance of Nobby Buttons, who, Spittleworth feared, had also fallen prey to the monster. Herringbone, who'd always deplored the influence of Spittleworth and Flapoon on the king, waited for Spittleworth to finish his farrago of lies with the air of a wily old fox who waits a rabbit hole for his dinner. A fascinating tale, he said when Spittleworth had finished, but I hereby relieve you of any further responsibility in the matter, Lord Spittleworth. The advisers will take charge now. There are laws and protocols in Cornucopia to deal with emergencies such as these. Firstly, the men in the dungeons will be given a proper trial so that we can hear their version of events. Secondly, the lists of the king's soldiers must be searched to find the family of this Nobby Buttons and inform them of his death. Thirdly, Major Beamish's body must be closely examined by the king's physicians so that we may learn more about the monster that killed him. Spittleworth opened his mouth very wide but nothing came out. He saw his whole glorious scheme collapsing on top of him and himself trapped beneath it, imprisoned by his own cleverness. cleverness. Then Major Roach, who was standing behind the chief advisor, slowly put down his rifle and took a sword from the wall. A look like a flash of light on dark water passed between Roach and Spittleworth, who said, I think, Herringbone, that you are ripe for retirement. Steel flashed, and the tip of Roach's sword appeared out of the chief advisor's belly. The soldiers gasped, but the chief advisor didn't utter a word. He simply knelt, then toppled over, dead. Spittleworth looked around at the soldiers who'd agreed to believe in the Ichabog. He liked seeing the fear on every face. He could feel his own power. Did everybody hear the chief advisor appointing me to his job before he retired? He said softly. The soldiers all nodded. They just stood by and watched murder and felt too deeply involved to protest. They all, all they cared about now was escaping this room alive and protecting their families. Very well then, said Spittleworth. The king believes the Ichabod is real and I stand with the king. I am the new chief advisor and I will be devising a plan to protect the kingdom. All who are loyal to the king will find their lives run very much as before and any who stand against the king will suffer the penalty of cowards and traitors, imprisonment or death. Now, I need one of you gentlemen to assist Major Roach in burying the body of our dear chief advisor and be sure and put him where he won't be found. The rest of you are free to return to your families and inform them of the danger of threatening our beloved cornucopia. Chapter 19, Lady Eslander. Spittleworth now marched off towards the dungeons. With Herringbone gone, there was no, nothing to stop him killing the three Irish soldiers. He intended to shoot them himself. There would be time enough to invent a story afterwards. Possibly he could place their bodies in the vault where the crown jewels were kept and pretend they'd been trying to steal them. However, just as Spittleworth had his hand on the door to the dungeons, a quiet voice spoke out of the darkness behind him. Good evening, Lord Spittleworth. He turned and saw Lady Islanda, raven-haired and serious, stepping down from a dark spiral staircase. 
You're awake late, my lady, said Spittleworth with a bang. Yes, said Lady Aslander, whose heart was beating very fast. I, I couldn't sleep. I thought I'd take a stroll. This was a fib. In fact, Lady Aslander, Aslander had been fast asleep in her bed when she was awoken by a frantic knocking on her bedroom door. Opening it, she found Hetty standing there, the maid who'd served Spittleworth his wine and heard his lies about knobby buttons. Hetty had been so curious about what Spittleworth was up to after his story about knobby buttons that she'd crept along to the guard's room and, by pressing her ear to the door, heard everything that was going on inside. Hetty ran and hid where the, when the three honest soldiers were dragged away and sped upstairs to wake Lady Aslander. She wanted to help the men who were about to be shot. The maid had no idea that Aslander was secretly in love with Captain Goodfellow. She simply liked Lady Aslander best of all the ladies at court and knew her to be kind and clever. Lady Islander hastily pressed some gold into Hetty's hand and advised her to leave the palace that night because she was afraid the maid might now be in grave danger. Then Lady Islander dressed herself with trembling hands, seized a lantern and hurried down the spiral staircase beside her bedroom. However, before she reached the bottom of the stairs, she heard voices. Blowing out her lantern, Eslanda listened as Herringbone gave the order for Captain Goodfellow and his friends to be taken to the dungeons instead of being shot. She'd been hiding on the stairs ever since because she had a feeling that danger threatening the men might not yet have passed. And here, sure enough, was Lord Spittleworth heading for the dungeons with pistol. Is the chief advisor anywhere about? Lady Eslanda asked. I thought I heard his voice earlier. Herringbone has retired, said Spittleworth. You see standing before you the new chief advisor, my lady. Oh, congratulations, said Eslanda, pretending to be pleased, although she was horrified. So it will be you who oversees the trial of the three soldiers in the dungeons, will it? You're very well informed, Lady Eslanda, said Spittleworth, eyeing her closely. How did you know there are three soldiers in the dungeons? Oh, I happened to hear Herringbone mention them, said Lady Aslanda. They're well-respected men, it seems. He was saying how important it will be for them to have a fair trial. I know King Fred will agree, because he cares deeply about his own popularity, as he should, for if a king is to be effective, he must be loved. Lady Aslanda did a good job of pretending that she was thinking only of the king's popularity. And I think nine out of ten people would have believed her. Unfortunately, Spittleworth heard the tremor in her voice and suspected that she must be in love with one of these men to hurry down the stairs in the dead of night in hope of saving their lives. I wonder, he said, watching her closely, which of them it is whom you care so much about? Lady Islander would have stopped herself blushing if she could, but unfortunately she couldn't. I don't think it can be Ogden, mused Spittleworth, because he's a very plain man. In any case, he already has a wife. Might it be Wagstaff? He's an amusing fellow, but, but prone to boils. No, said Lord Spittleworth softly. I think it must be the handsome Captain Goodfellow who makes you blush, Lady Islander. But would you really steep so low? His parents were cheesemakers, you know. It makes no difference to me whether a man is a cheesemaker or a king, so as long as he behaves with honour, said Lady Islander. And the king will be dishonoured if those soldiers are shot without trial, and so I'll tell him when he wakes. Lady Islander then turned, trembling and climbed the spiral staircase. She had no idea whether she said enough to save the soldiers' lives, so she spent a sleepless night. Spittleworth remained standing in the chilly passage until his feet were so cold he could barely feel them. He was trying to decide what to do. On the one hand, he really did want to get rid of these soldiers who knew far too much. On the other, he feared Lady Islander was right. People would blame the king if the men were shot without trial. Then Fred would be angry at Spittleworth and might even take the job of chief advisor away from him. If that happened, all the dreams of powers and riches that Spittleworth had enjoyed on the journey back from the Martians would be dashed. So Spittleworth turned away from the dungeon door and headed to his bed. 
he was deeply offended by the idea that Lady Islander, whom he'd once hoped to marry, preferred the son of a cheesemaker. As he blew out his candle, Spittleworth decided that she would pay one day for that insult. Chapter 20 Medals for Beamish and Buttons When King Fredwick next morning was informed that his chief advisor had retired at this critical moment in the country's history, he was furious. It came as a great relief to know that Spittleworth would be taken over because Fred knew that Spittleworth understood the grave danger facing the kingdom. Though feeling safer now that he was back in his palace with its high walls and cannon mounted turrets, its portcullis and its moat, Fred was unable to shake off the shock of his trip. He stayed shut up in his private apartments and had all his meals brought up to him on golden trays. Instead of going hunting, he paced up and down on his thick carpets, reliving his awful adventure in the north and meeting only his best friends, who were careful to keep his fears alive. On the third day after their return from the marshlands, Spittleworth entered the king's private apartments with a sombre face and announced that soldiers who'd been sent back to the marshland to find out what happened to private Nobby Buttons had discovered nothing but his blood-stained shoes, a single horseshoe and a few well gnawed bones. The king turned white and sat down on a satin sofa. Oh, how dreadful! How dreadful! Private Buttons! Reminds me, which one was he? Young man, Freckles, only son of a widowed mother, said Spittleworth, the newest recruit to the Royal Guard and such a promising boy. Tragic, really. And the worst of it is, between Beamish and Buttons, the Ichabob has developed a taste for human flesh, precisely as your majesty predicted. It is really astonishing, if I may say so, how your majesty grasped the danger from the first. But what is to be done, Spittleworth, if the monster is hungry for more human prey? Give it to me, your majesty, said Spittleworth soothingly. I'm chief adviser, you know, and I'm at work day and night to keep the kingdom safe. I'm so glad Herringbone appointed you as successor, Spittleworth, said Fred. What would I do without you? Oh, tish pish, your majesty, tis an honour to serve so great as a king. Now, we ought to discuss tomorrow's funerals. We're intending to bury what's left of Buttons next to Major Beamish. It is to be a state occasion, you know, with plenty of pomp and ceremony, and I think it would be a very nice touch if you could present the Medal of Outstanding Bravery against the deadly Ichabod to the relatives of the dead men. Oh, is there a medal? said Fred. Certainly there is, sire, and that reminds me, you haven't yet received your own. From an inner pocket, Spittleworth pulled out the most gorgeous gold medal, almost as large as a saucer. Embossed upon the medal was a monster with gleaming ruby eyes, which was being fought by a handsome, muscular man wearing a crown. The whole thing was suspended from a scarlet velvet ribbon. Mine? said the king, wide-eyed. But of course, sire, said Spittleworth. Did your majesty not plunge your sword into the monster's loathsome neck? We all remember it happening, sire. King Fred fingered the heavy gold medal. Though he said nothing, he was undergoing a silent struggle. Fred's honesty had piped up in a small, clear voice. It didn't happen like that. You know it didn't. You saw the Ichabog in the fog. You dropped your sword and you ran away. You never stabbed it. You were never near enough. But Fred's cowardice blustered louder than his honesty. You've already agreed with Spitterworth that that's what happened. What a fool you look if you admit you ran away. And Fred's vanity spoke loudest of all. After all, I was the one who led the hunt for the Ichabod. I was the one who saw it first. I deserve this medal and it will stand out beautifully against the black funeral suit. So Fred said, Yes, Spitterworth, it all happened just as you said. Naturally, one doesn't like to boast. Your Majesty's modesty is legendary, said Spittleworth, bowing low to hide his smirk. The following day was declared a national day of mourning in honour of the Ichabod's victims. Crowds lined the street to watch Major Beamish and Private Button's coffins pass on wagons drawn by plumed black horses. King Fred rode behind the coffins on a jet black horse with the medal for outstanding bravery against the deadly Ichabod bouncing on his chest and reflecting the sunlight so brightly that it hurt the eyes of the crowd. 
Behind the king walked Mrs. Beamish and Bert, who dressed in black, and behind them came a howling old woman in a ginger wig, who'd been introduced to them as Mrs. Buttons, Nobby's mother. Oh, my Nobby, she wailed as she walked. Oh, down with the awful Ichabog, you killed my poor Nobby. The coffins were lowered into graves and the national anthem was played by the king's buglers. Button's coffin was particularly heavy because it had been filled with bricks. The odd-looking Mrs Buttons wailed and cursed the Ichabog again while ten sweating men lowered her son's coffin into the ground. Mrs Beamish and Bert stood quietly weeping. Then King Fred called for the, ge the grieving relatives forward to receive their medals. Spittleworth hadn't been prepared to spend as much money on Beamish and the imaginary buttons that he'd spent on the king, so their medals were made of silver rather than gold. However, it made an affecting ceremony, especially as Mrs Buttons was so overcome that she fell to the ground and kissed the king's boots. Mrs Beamish and Bert walked home from the funeral and the crowds parted respectfully to let them pass. Only once did Mrs Beamish pause, and that was when her old friend Mr Dovetail stepped out of the crowd to tell her how sorry he was. The two embraced. Daisy wanted to say something to Bert, but the whole crowd was staring and she couldn't even catch his eye because he was scowling at his feet. Before she knew it, her father had released Mrs Beamish and Daisy watched her best friend and his mother walk out of sight. Once they were back in the cottage, Mrs Beamish threw herself face down on the bed where she sobbed and sobbed. Bert tried to comfort her, but nothing worked, so he took his father's medal into his own bedroom and placed it on the mantelpiece. Only when he stood back to look at it did he realise that he'd placed his father's medal right beside the wooden Ichabog that Mr Dovetail had carved for him so long ago. Until this moment, Bert hadn't connected the toy Ichabog with the way his father had died. Now he lifted the wooden model from its shelf, placed it on the floor, picked up a poker and smashed the toy Ichabod to splinters. Then he picked up the, rem the remnants of the shattered toy and threw them into the fire. As he watched the flames leap higher and higher, he vowed that one day, when he was old enough, he'd hunt down the Ichabod and revenge himself upon the monster that had killed his father. That's it for part six.